is changing literally every second, every uh, every minute, every day. Um, so it's hard to really kind of sum up this hectic and chaotic week that we've had. Um, however, uh, we, we do want to keep in mind as you're listening in, as we're uh, approaching this discussion, uh, as this situation uh, evolves, uh, there is actively, you know, a war of information going on, different governments publishing different uh, bits of media that are favorable to one cause or another. And so hopefully that in this space, we can have a respectful and a patient dialogue about these events uh, that are taking place. Uh, and to facilitate that, we are very fortunate to be joined by some, some real experts in the field uh, of, of international relations. We have some, some UAlbany professors that are, that are here. I'm just going to uh, introduce them all right now. Uh, first of all, speaking first, is going to be Nadia Kazenko. She's a professor of uh, religious studies and a program director at UAlbany. Uh, oh, sorry, I just, just got to, sorry, I got to minimize that. My bad, my bad. Sorry about that. Uh, she researches and teaches Russian history with a focus on religion and culture, including the crucially important World War II period for Russia, Ukraine. Uh, she is going to be speaking first. After that, we're going to have Ryan Irwin, Associate Professor and Director of the Institute for History and Public Engagement at UAlbany. Professor Irwin is interested in global governance and decolonization, as well as the relationship between 19th century political theory and 20th century international politics. Uh, lastly, we'll have Carl Bontempo, who is an associate professor of history at UAlbany. He specializes in 20th century United States political and public policy history, as well as the histories of refugees, immigration, and human rights. So we'll be hearing from each of these speakers for about 10 to 15 minutes. That should take us to the first 45 minute mark of the program. Uh, after that, there'll be about 15 minutes for questions directed at our, at our uh, professors. And then after that, the hour from seven o'clock onwards, we are going to open up the floor to, to you folks there in, in the comments here in the lobby, because we do want to hear from you guys. This is an important part of our history, an important perhaps turning point, uh, some uh, people are speculating, and we want to know what the people of Schenectady of the greater capital region have to think and feel about this momentous occasion. Uh, and we'll kind of, we'll get into the, the rules of the discussion a little bit later, uh, but we want to start now. Again, uh, thank you, Nadia, for, for speaking first. I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thanks. Hello, everyone. Um, this session was meant to be about what it means to think historically about the present, but in my case, it is particularly problematic. And it's particularly problematic because of how Vladimir Putin used history as grounds for his attack on Ukraine. First, um, in a speech in July of last year, then a few weeks ago in a speech on February 21st, and then of course in his actual attack. And it's problematic because a lot of what Putin said did have some truth in it. Over a thousand years ago, parts of present day Ukraine, Russia and Belarus were one nation. Over 300 years ago, Ukrainian Cossack hetman Bogdan Khmelnytsky did swear an oath of allegiance to the Tsar of Russia. In the centuries that followed, many Ukrainians did contribute to the culture of Imperial Russia. The Austrians did use the Ukrainians in their empire against Imperial Russia, as had the Poles. Ukrainian nationalists did collaborate with the Nazis during the Second World War. We could go on and on. If anyone is interested in any specific details in the Q&A, I am happy to. But you know what? None of that history, in fact, matters. What does matter is that Putin used historical claims, true or false, as a justification for something that had nothing to do with history. Two weeks ago, on February 21st, just before he went in, Putin appealed to tropes like, I quote, Western countries rejected Russia's repeated calls for dialogue, unquote. Quote, Ukraine was dragged into a dangerous geopolitical game aimed at turning Ukraine into a barrier between Europe and Russia, into a springboard against Russia. Here comes the best part. Western countries directly interfered in, U in Ukraine's internal affairs and supported the 2014 revolution. Their slogans, ideology, and blatant aggressive Russophobia have become defining elements of state policy in Ukraine. Russians, Russia's in Ukraine, this is Putin talking, <laughs> 
are being forced not only to deny their roots, generations of their ancestors, but also to believe that Russia is their enemy. It would not be an exaggeration to say that the path of forced assimilation, the formation of an ethnically pure Ukrainian state, aggressive towards Russia is, now let's wait for this part, comparable in its consequences to the use of weapons of mass destruction against us. Let's hear that part again. This is Putin two weeks ago. Comparable to the use of weapons of mass destruction against Russia. Now, back to Putin's claims about 2014. Quote, millions of Ukrainians then rejected being anti-Russian. The people of Crimea and residents of Sebastopol, Sevastopol made their choice. People in the Southeast, in Donetsk and Luhansk, peacefully tried to defend their stance. Yet all of them were labeled as separatists and terrorists. They were, they were threatened with ethnic cleansing and the use of military force. And the residents of Donetsk and Luhansk took up arms to defend their home, their language, and their lives. This, Putin claimed, resulted in more than 13,000 people killed in the Donbass. Somebody had to defend them, and who better than he? Now, when, stepping, when he stepped away from history, Putin came closer to his real aims. Putin's argument was that Western countries, and especially NATO, were using Ukraine as a tool to take it over so as to further their own anti-Russian aims. He saw Western countries creating, um, quote, not just complete dependence, but direct external control, including the supervision of Ukrainian security services and armed forces by foreign advisors and deployment of NATO infrastructure. Putin claimed that, quote, many Ukrainians found this anti-Russia project unacceptable, but they were not allowed to raise their heads. They had their legal opportunity to defend their point of view taken away from them. They were intimidated, driven underground. Not only were they persecuted for their convictions, for the open expression of their position, but they are also killed. You know what? I can't go on quoting Putin any longer. I just can't stand it because it is important to stress that what Putin was saying was not in fact true. Many Russians did and do live in Ukraine, true. Before February 24th, some of them did think both privately and publicly that Ukraine was a mess. A few even looked longingly across the border at how much more orderly everything in Russia seemed. Also true, but no one intimidated them. No one drove these people underground. They could grumble about politics. Some of them did grumble about politics, but they could and did lead a normal life until February 24th. But Putin's historical claims put an end to that normal life. The crucial quote from Putin is, we will never allow our historical territories and people close to us living there to be used against Russia. Those who will tomorrow undertake such an attempt, I would like to say to them that in this way, they will destroy their own country, end quote. The irony is this, no one except Putin himself has undertaken such an attempt. Whatever one wants to say about Ukraine and the range of political opinions of the people living in Ukraine before February 24th, clearly none of them posed a military threat to Russia. Whatever one wants to say about the EU, the US or NATO before February 24th, none of them were shelling Russia. None of them are shelling Russia now. This is on Putin. He started it unprovoked. Once you attack, as Putin did, you are breaking international law. You are the bad guy. And once you are attacked, as the Ukrainians were, any mixed feelings you might have had earlier vanish. Putin has done more to unite Ukraine than any Ukrainian hero from the past. All of that may seem obvious, but I stress this because an astounding number of people do not see it. And I don't mean only people in Russia. In fact, people in Russia might be forgiven because of how brutally their protests in 2011 and 2013 were put down. Then, if I may remind you, hundreds of thousands of people took to the streets to protest the falsification of election and the usurpation of power by Vladimir Putin. The same happened last year in Belarus. Demonstrators were apprehended, 
arrested, tortured, and imprisoned for years, as they are being now for coming out in protest against what Putin is doing. So my issue is not with Russians. Putin's last words apply to Russians more than to anyone. He said, those who try, what he tried, they will destroy their own country. Well, Putin is going to destroy his own country. And I don't mean Ukraine, although that's what he's, concentr that's what he's concentrating on first. As he destroys both places, Ukraine deliberately, Russia as collateral, collateral damage, let's be clear. This is not about history. This is about international law. History had nothing to do with it. One man's manipulating it, on the other hand, did. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Nadia. Uh, we're gonna proceed right along with uh, Professor Irwin, uh, if you'd like to begin. Great. <clears throat> Is history relevant? Does a knowledge of the past equip a person to understand the present better? If yes, how? If no, uh, why? These are interesting questions regardless of the context and they're made urgent by the war in Ukraine. In the past eight days, I found myself tangling with these questions and conversations with students and friends, a spattering of journalists. Everybody seems to be searching for a historical context to make sense of Putin's invasion. Not surprisingly, these conversations often start in the same place. Is this our Munich moment? The reference is to 1938. If your history is foggy, a very famous gathering happened that year, prompted by Hitler's move to annex part of Czechoslovakia. Europe's leaders forged an uneasy agreement in Munich, allowing Germany to colonize part of Czechoslovakia in exchange for the promise that he would limit his ambitions. Afterwards, the deal was heralded as a diplomatic triumph. Memorably, British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain told his countrymen that Munich signified, quote, peace in our time. That phrase has not aged well, as everyone knows, Hitler and Stalin invaded Poland the following year and Europe plunged into World War II. When someone asks whether we're living through a Munich moment, they're making a point about appeasement. The common assumption, especially among a subset of political scientists, is that Munich emboldened Hitler. He invaded Poland in 1939 because his neighbors let him take Czechoslovakia in 1938. So the logic is as follows, if Americans let Putin take Kiev today, we'll be defending Berlin tomorrow. One pastime of historians is deflating bad metaphors. And the Munich analogy has some problems. On the one hand, it's been used and abused too many times already, often to justify military interventions that seem problematic afterwards. On the other hand, the main lesson is arguably wrong. When you look at Munich's, Munich through Hitler's eyes by studying the history of Nazi Germany, the road to World War II becomes more complex. Munich wasn't a lost moment so much as an inflection point where a whole host of assumptions about autarky and borders, they sort of came together and then, and then fell apart as they, as they interacted. So is this our Munich moment? No, history doesn't repeat itself. And I'm wary of people who claim otherwise because I think they're misrepresenting the past and misjudging the United States' capacity to change the situation in Ukraine without provoking a nuclear war. But the metaphor can be generative. Although history offers very few timeless lessons, historians are masters of contextualization, thinkers who take disparate moments and weave them into these chains of action that we call narrative. If one of our pastimes is deflating bad metaphors, another is spinning out narrative and then debating how background, how much background is necessary to comprehend any given moment in time. So briefly, let me unspool a narrative that qualifies the point I just made. I don't think we should escalate the Ukraine war because of something that happened in Munich 84 years ago, but I do wonder if we're in an era now that resembles that earlier time. Let me tell a short version of a long story. It begins with an argument that many historians wouldn't accept. The globalization process, if you define it as 
the act of creating trade and travel infrastructures, the globalization process ended in the middle decades of the 19th century. Now these globalization infrastructures got faster, but after the mid 19th century, frontiers became a thing of the past. For the first time, the planet was discussed as a closed circuit and the subsequent 170 years could be read as one long contest to determine how our globalized planet will work. Well, we have nation states or empires, international organizations that stabilize for-profit labor markets or worldwide revolution to foster industrialization without capitalism. Now, if this argument is correct, if globalization ended in the mid 19th century, if we've been having one long conversation for 170 years about how to interact with each other in this context, one of the most powerful claims in the globalized arena has been that the empire that controls the rim of Eurasia determines how everybody else interacts. A British geographer invented this claim at the end of the 19th century saying that if Great Britain shaped how goods and people traveled through the territory that connected China to Europe, well, the British Empire would have leverage over everybody else. This claim is too simplistic to be true, but it has seduced powerful individuals periodically. For example, George Kennan, who is the American architect of our Cold War strategy, believed this theory very earnestly. Containment, he said, promised to halt Soviet expansion into the rim of Eurasia so that Americans could consolidate their power and their influence there. I think this narrative suggests two points. Number one, Putin speaks this language. Clearly, as Nadia just explained, he sees Ukraine, its tentative steps toward a security relationship with Europe through a geopolitical lens. Recognizing our current moment in a longer narrative can help us make sense of Putin's arguments and his behavior. His latest invasion did not happen overnight. It may prove to be a miscalculation. I think it's an abomination, but he's not necessarily irrational. I think he sees himself as a transformational figure within this long drama for Eurasian power. And my second point circles back to Munich. That ill-fated compromise was one moment in a 30-year conflict. The conflict bridged World War I and World War II. And one compelling way to interpret that 30-year conflict is actually geopolitics. Because if globalization ended in the mid 19th century, Britain was the world's first true hegemon, dominating the rim of Eurasia until the early 20th century. It lost its primacy against the backdrop of German and Japanese ascendants and then passed the baton to the United States after World War II. So perhaps we are living through a Munich moment not a crisis that demands American action, but an inflection point in a decades long story about American decline. If the United States consolidated its hegemony over the rim of Eurasia in the 1990s after the Cold War, which I think is a reasonable thing to say, trends have clearly eroded that supremacy over the past 20 years. And on that note, I'll pass things to Carl. Thank you very much, thank you. Uh, Carl, take it away. Okay, great. Um, thanks to Ryan and Nadia for setting the stage. Um, I'm going to speak a bit about something um, a little more particular, which is the current humanitarian um, and refugee uh, situation in Ukraine. Um, so I'm gonna start by just outlining where things stand right now, uh, which is that over 1 million people uh, have fled Ukraine um, that is out of a Ukrainian population of about 44 million individuals. So it's about two and a half percent of the population. Um, about half a million of those folks who have fled have headed into Poland. Large numbers have gone to Hungary, uh, Moldova, Romania, and Slovakia. So what we're seeing is uh, refugee flows into neighboring um, states. This is actually only part of the problem because um, an unknown number of Ukrainians are what we call internally displaced. Um, that means they are no longer able uh, to safely live in their usual communities or residences. 
and have moved uh, uh, inside Ukraine in an attempt to find some sort of safety. These people may become technically refugees if they cross over borders, but right now they are internally displaced. Uh, the United Nations yesterday estimated that as many as 4 million Ukrainians may become refugees uh, during this crisis. I'm actually not quite sure how they arrived at that precise number, um, but it would work out to about 10% of the total population of the country. Um, all of this current situation, and I will just say that things are changing rapidly on the ground. And so the numbers that I gave to you today will probably look very different in about two days. Um, all of this uh, leads to one question, which is actually how um, large is this, is this refugee crisis? Um, and I want to I want to highlight two ways of thinking about this. Uh, one is sort of historically in the longer run, and one is historically in the shorter run. Um, one way to think about it is, and I choose this example uh, with reason. And I'll come back to it later. But uh, is the Hungarian refugee crisis of 1956 right? Um, in that instance, um, about 200,000 Hungarians fled uh, the Soviet Union's military invasion. Um, that was out of a total of 9 million Hungarians. So that's about 2% of the population uh, in that entire Hungarian episode in the 1950s. Um, the closer to us historical example is 2021. If we just look at global refugee populations, right? Uh, in 2021, the UN estimates there are 84 million people forcibly displaced around the world, okay? they count 26.6 million of those individuals as refugees, meaning people who have fled their homes and crossed over a state border and into another, another state or country. Um, if you wanna understand it, that dive down into that number even more, those 26.6 million, understand that in 2021, Syria had produced 6.6 .6 million refugees alone, okay? And that means 6.6 .6 million Syrians had left their country and headed to countries uh, basically next door to Syria. In addition to that, Syria in 2021 had 6.7 million internally displaced individuals. Um, I think this is an interesting fact, right? Because what both of these things point to Right, what both of these historical mo moments point to is that we are, this is not yet a historically large uh, refugee situation. That doesn't mean it's not dire. That doesn't mean that there ought not to be action, but in a larger context, and especially in a context of a world in which uh, we live in, where you have 84 million displaced people, right? Um, this is a, a, a smaller, a smaller refugee crisis than others that exist right now as we speak. So that being said, let me think a little bit to help you think through maybe a couple of historical frameworks um, that can help us perhaps better understand this humanitarian and refugee uh, moment that we're in. Um, and the first uh, moment I wanna talk a little bit about is that Cold War Hungary example. Um, and the U.S. response to the Hungarian refugee crisis. Um, in my reading, uh, talking to journalists and things like that uh, in the last couple of days, the Hungarian crisis in 1956 has come up the most as this sort of historical analog. I, I think in large part because one, it's roughly in the same part of the world. Uh, two, uh, there seems to be a, uh, 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 an interest among folks uh, in asking whether or not we are in a new cold war uh, with Russia. Uh, and then uh, three, uh, because there are some parallels, interesting historical parallels. Right. So in 1956, for those of us who weren't around then or don't remember it, uh, the Soviet Union invaded Hungary to subdue a social democratic revolution in that country uh, that aimed to break Hungary loose from the Soviet empire. And the Soviets intervened militarily to try to hold together their Eastern European empire. Uh, the Soviets did manage to crush the Hungarian revolution. Uh, and as part of that, 
uh, right, you have this large number of refugees fleeing Hungary, largely into Austria, right, right next door. Um, as a result, the United States and its allies launched uh, a couple of programs to bring refugees out of Austria and, and resettle them throughout Western Europe and the Americas. Um, and the United States in this case took in 40,000 Hungarian refugees. Um, I do think there are real limits though to this historical analogy. I, I buy that there are some important, although I think in some ways almost superficial similarities, right? You do have in both cases, Soviet Russian aggression, right? Um, in both cases, you have refugee admissions being justified in large part because of uh, American sympathy with victims of this aggression. But I don't think we're seeing a replay of Hungary in 1956 or we're likely to. Uh, for a few reasons. The first reason is this, um, the current US-Russian conflict, and I'd like to hear maybe Ryan and Nadia's thoughts on this as well, but I think the current US-Russian conflict lacks the sort of geopolitical resonance of the Cold War. Uh, if we recall the Cold War, each side framed it as a conflict as uh, former President George H.W. Bush put it, quote, for the soul of mankind, end quote. Um, and that's definitely not how I think uh, this current uh, uh, geopolitical moment is being, is being framed. Um, and so therefore these types of justifications for refugee admissions or refugee aid are, are less likely to flow from this type, of, uh, this type of framing that we saw in the 1950s. Um, the second thing that's going on that, that sort of makes this different than the hungry moment uh, is that Americans in the 1950s at home uh, did debate the wisdom of refugee admissions and whether it was a good policy, but they did so with none, with none of the vitriol that immigration and refugee politics take on today. In other words, immigration today is a hot button political issue in the United States, much more so than in the 1950s. And um, this makes policymaking in our current environment a very different thing when it comes to refugees than you might've seen in the 1950s. Um, as a result, I think the analogy is strained when trying to understand the current Ukrainian refugee crisis. And I think it's dangerous to use the Hungary example uh, as a way to try to understand what might happen in the present situation or what is happening. Um, the second thing, uh, the second sort of historical context that I wanna bring up here is the larger turn in refugee admissions policies in the late 20th century and in the early 21st century. This is a phenomena that scholars have started to really uh, 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 excavate um, in the last couple of years. Um, and the point that they make, and I think it's a well taken one, is that uh, in the last sort of 20 to 30 years, uh, Western industrial nations, including the United States, have proven much more skeptical and even outright opposed to refugee admissions in the last uh, couple of decades. Um, it is true, right? Going back even into the 1990s when the global refugee and displaced population explodes, these same countries have set up small programs to admit, to admit refugees. But at the same time, the larger phenomena we've seen over the last three decades is that these countries have perfected systems of deterrence, right? Uh, what one uh, scholar calls an architecture of refugee repulsion. The idea being these states have tried to find ways to not admit refugees, to not allow them to cross borders and to certainly not allow them to resettle. As a result, the Ukrainian crisis comes as nations have perfected, I think, the means of both minuscule admissions programs and how to repulse large numbers of refugees. As a result, I do think this leads to some really rough days ahead when it comes to the Ukrainians who are currently entering uh, uh, neighboring Eastern European states. I have doubts about whether the Ukrainian refugee crisis will change this larger dynamic. The forces that produced this larger policy architecture of repulsion are deeply embedded in these societies and politics uh, that come out of those societies. Uh, moreover, 
One sees this really clearly, I think, in some of the reactions to the Ukrainian refugees. And here I'm referring to the, the, uh, the, the commentary that, quote, they are like us, end quote. When you think about that, it means that other refugees, those from the Middle East or from North Africa, are not like us, are not like these Ukrainians. And why are they not like the Ukrainians? They come from different political, cultural, social traditions, and they often have different racial and ethnic backgrounds. All of this points to the larger politics and the larger social relations that any reaction to a refugee crisis and a refugee problem surely comes out of. Um, and I think that we ought to keep those short-term and long-term histories in mind as we try to think through exactly how this might unfold. Um, and I'll just add, if anybody has questions about how the United States goes about admitting refugees and what steps the uh, United States might take, I could answer some of those questions in the, um, in the, uh, in the Q and A. So thank you. Well, thank you so much, Carl. And speaking of the Q and A, um, we, we can get into that. Um, Nadia or Ryan, is there anything that you wanted to, to, to say before we get into that session? Um, I'd like to actually, if I may, um, since Carl raised a few things, um, the issue of what American refugee policy in the 1950s being very different resonates with me because of course that's when my parents who were refugees from Ukraine arrived in the United States. So indeed, yes, it was a very different time. I agree that now, it's not like a Cold War. It actually is more like the atmosphere of the 1930s. This is not about ideology. This is about local strongmen taking power and trying to pursue their own means without necessarily having a broader um, ideological support outside. The thing is, um, there's actually two points in particular, though. Germany did take in a lot of refugees from Syria in the last five years. I think that needs to be said, like unlike um, just about any other country in Europe, it really did and it did a good job settling them. So that should go, um, that needs to be said. And finally, it's actually quite staggering to me to see how much Europe, and not the United States, how much Europe has mobilized to help out the Ukrainian refugees. Every day in my own social media feeds, um, France is offering working papers and settlements and housing. Other European countries are as well. Hungary is offering free flights to any European country to settle. So the infrastructure of support that has popped up almost overnight for the Ukrainian refugees is utterly unique. I mean, I, I've, I, I've never seen anything like it. And it's, 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 it's quite something. I don't know how long it'll last, but it really is quite something. And if it is indeed because they are white Christian or white Jewish people, that does say a lot about Europe and what Europe is willing to help and not help. So that's all. Thank you. I would just accentuate what Nadia and Nadia said, I, I, and what Carl said as well, I think that the the comparison to 1956, the sort of situating the, the current um, crisis as the beginning chapter of a, of a second Cold War um, is problematic for reasons that I think people are identifying even in the, in the chat, because the kind of the ideological dimensions are, are not as present. I am more drawn to the 30s on, on two levels. Um, number one, as, as Nadia said, the impulse is so strong men or, or autarkic worldviews. I think this is what makes Putin so uh, so compelling as an intellectual figure, or so interesting as an intellectual figure is a better word, um, because his his vision of a greater Russia is, is so rooted in this older form of autarkic thinking. Um, and I think the second point that I'd say is, if you look at the, the 1930s, follows on this period of, of tremendous uh, optimism and, and energy around internet, different, different types of international projects. And I think we're in a moment similarly when um, liberal internationalism uh, writ large is, is, under, is, is under some, some duress. And I find that to be a really interesting, interesting moment. Again, I, Carl, I, I tend to agree. You can date that maybe to the Iraq war or you can date it to the Syrian refugee crisis. But I find one of the things that I'm looking at it, it just personally as I read the, the newspaper is whether or not the right or, and the left will rally around Biden. 
uh, because it seems as though the language around American power and uh, American interests is, is actually quite similar on the right and, and the left. I think both sides see the United States not as a, a liberal internationalist power investing in, in universal values or spreading these universal values, but as an empire among empires. Um, and, I, and I think the implications of that, it, the, the free world is an intellectual project that's taken earnestly. I think that is in the past tense. And so it'll be fascinating to see how, how Biden, who is in some respects, um, you know, an exemplar of an older guard, uh, how, he can, how he can move forward if, um, if the right and the left don't rally around, around him uh, as, uh, in, in the context of this crisis. So I do find the, the 30s being a, an interesting um, comparison point. I mean, I would just add, oh, no, no, I would ahead. just add, yeah, yeah. No, I would add to, to Nadia's comment, uh, and she ended with it, it's early days yet. And I think, uh, um, you know, these things, you saw this, you, you, you do see this sometimes this sort of, in the United States, what do we call it? The rally around the flag uh, uh, moment, right? And I think you're seeing some of that when it comes to, to refugee admissions. I'll be interested to see how things uh, work when we're, if, if you end up dealing with millions uh, who are who are uh, in in you know forced uh, forcibly expelled, and then you've got to think through resettlement uh, programs and options and things like that. Um, so I think it's early days, and we'll see uh, where it, where it goes. Um, and I think also the two points that both of you brought up that are really fascinating for me as a historian of migration are the ways in which when these sort of moments of autarky or moments of liberal internationalism, right? Moments of empire building, empire falling, whatever we wanna talk about on that front, right? Um, they have, we don't often think about this, but they have real effects on migration, right? When those regimes, when those, uh, those, those ways of organizing, right? Societies uh, or collecting societies together in a sort of organized fashion, right? When they, when they shudder, or when they come under duress and, and pressure, th these are things that lead folks to move, right? And so I do think uh, we're not, um, it's not wrong to look at that as, as, as uh, in sort of a, a, a sort of larger historical lens as seeing that link between these, 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 these moments uh, that migration kind of ties it together in some ways. Hmm. Well, well, excellent. So at that point, I think we will turn things over to, to some questions. We've had some questions building up in the chat here. Um, and kind of the way we're going to work in general with the audience participation is we are going to uh, take one question or one comment at a time. So I see uh, Rob Morton, you got a lot of questions in there, but I'm, I'm going to try to get through everyone who has a question before we, uh, if we have time, circle back to your second or third question, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and now, if you guys have questions, please do post them in the chat. This is the time to do that. Uh, this isn't exactly the comment period. Again, in just a little bit, we're going to open up the floor to, to public comments on the situation. This is just a time for questions for our, our, our academics here in the chat to see what their perspective is uh, on that. And so we will begin with Rob Morton and his first question. Uh, why did the global community not respond as seriously eight years ago, the last time Russia took the Ukraine uh, took from the Ukraine after the Winter Olympics in Sochi? Uh, and I guess this is for whoever wants to jump in on that. It's a big question, I'm sure. Um, I'll um, I'll offer my two cents, and then I'm happy to turn it over to my colleagues. Um, I think it's because in um, with Crimea, there was at least the pretense something that one doesn't have now. There was at least the pretense that people who lived in Crimea were given a chance to vote. Um, you can say, oh, but there were like Russian, you know, troops on location and so on. You know, men in men in unmarked green uniforms. That is true, of course. But there was at least to the fiction that there was that a region was given a chance to vote and even people um who who wanted Crimea to stay in Russia nevertheless admitted privately that in fact um that people there probably would have if they had been given a choice left to their own devices they actually probably would have liked to be part of Russia militarily which is not to say that Russia is allowed to do this, but simply there wasn't military force in quite the same way involved. And there was the illusion of an election 
um, and Ryan can talk to me um, and about all of us about the Anschluss in Austria, <laughs> um, if he is so inclined. But the point is simply that's um, somehow everyone decided that that wasn't worth fighting for. And also there was no actual fighting involved. I'd say that's the biggest difference. I'd agree. The only thing I'd add is just the, I, I think the international context, the second term of the Obama administration, there was so much happening um, that I think that this, the, the international context of this, of this moment, I think is a little bit different than, than again, the, the Carl's point about the Syrian refugee crisis. And um, I think future historians will find the second term of the, of the, of the Obama administration to be a really fascinating transition point where a whole set of assumptions about American power and international norms started to crumble. And we are now on the other side of that crumbling. Uh, and, and the last uh, six years have, have really seen, seen a, a huge amount of, of, of change, both here in the United States with the Trump administration, as well as in Europe uh, with Brexit and, and, and other things. So I think um, historians will probably look at that moment as the beginning of a, of a much bigger uh, shift. And we're now, um, you know, these things add up. Uh, we're, we're so much farther down the road. Hmm. Uh, Carl, anything you'd like to add to that or we can go on to the next question? No, I mean, I think I was thinking exact along the lines that, that Ryan was thinking about it. And, um, you know, from the US perspective, again, Ryan and I have these conversations all the time about whether or not the sort of break point was sometime after 2001 and the failed interventions, uh, you know, troubled interventions, if not failed, deeply troubled interventions in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, and that those things really do uh, uh, change change the, uh, the domestic political dynamic on a lot of this, on a lot of these questions. And add on top of that, it's hard to forget for those of us who live through it, you know, 2014, 2013, right? We're still living in the aftermath of the, of the Great Recession, right? People are still battered at home uh, by that. And so in the United States, for sure. And so, you know, it, 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 I guess my only point there would be that it limits what uh, policymakers in the United States, which is what I study, uh, what policymakers in the United States, what they perceive as possible, right? So it's not only the larger global changes that Ryan has outlined, but it's stuff happening at home too. Um, and I think that that's, that was a constraining, a constrained moment, I would put it that way. Hmm. Well, well, excellent. So we will uh, move on now. Uh, this is a question from Leo Giafrin, or I, perhaps I, I didn't get that right, but nevertheless, uh, what is the role of the Budapest Accord where Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons in exchange for promises of territorial integrity from US, Russia, and Great Britain? It feels like we've all forgotten this promise. Uh, do you guys have any comments on the Budapest Accords and how it relates to today? I don't have, com to confirm uh, the point, I have completely forgotten. <laughs> uh, that, that is something that I've certainly heard uh, quite a bit about in, in the news, um, you know. People making um, too. That I think I think it worth noting that at that point Russia was in a very different place. I mean, let's not forget this is Yeltsin. This is democratization. It was genuinely possible for Ukraine to think in the 1990s that Russia was headed in a similar direction to theirs, i.e., greater democratization and security and all of that. And um, it didn't seem like such a crazy idea in 1994, um, when that was drawn up to think that that might really be the case. Let's also not forget that this was after Chernobyl, right? So um, the idea of something going wrong from a nuclear point of view might also have been a part of it. Hmm. Okay. Well, again, as always, there's, there's always gonna be so much more to unpack with these questions, but if there's no more comments on the Budapest Accord, we can move on to a question from Mark V. Uh, what are the recent historical precedents for an occupation and installation of a puppet government, assuming that's the end game here, and how did they end up? Uh, did any end up in the occupier leaving? Now, that is a big question, but I'm, I'm sure you guys might have a thing or two to say about that. Yeah, the, the low hanging fruit is obviously Iraq um, and Afghanistan, and neither of those things worked out very well for the United States um, at all. The context is really different, but again, this is an argument that We've all heard Putin make multiple times that um, the United States is um, intellectually bankrupt because of those 
those two those two in projects. And I can't off the top of my head think of anything in the early 21st century uh, that is as relevant as the mm -hmm. Iraq invasion in particular, as well as the, the Afghan. I don't know if Carl, if you would agree, but. No, I think that's right. Um, and Iraq and Afghanistan were, as you put it, the, the low hanging fruit of, of that, of the, of those examples. Um, uh, and I'm trying to think back into, into, um, into the uh, uh, 20th century on sort of American relations with Latin America and Central America, um, right? And there you've got, you've got, if not puppet governments, right? You have governments that maybe lack uh, uh, popular, deep popular support and that are in many ways, right? Being propped up by American dollars uh, and American aid and, and American military help. Um, and, you know, those are uh, the United States, uh, you know, in many of those cases, you know, on the one hand, uh, uh, it, it, in many cases, it doesn't end well for American policy. Um, but on the other hand, right, and something to maybe keep in mind is that, that the people who really suffer in a lot of those cases are the folks who live in those countries. Uh, you know, the average everyday folks who, who, who live through the wars of Central America in the 70s and the 80s. Uh, and in the Caribbean and in Latin America, and some pretty horrific uh, uh, conditions. And I do think that's something maybe to keep in mind here as we as we ponder uh, what what may be to come um, in, in 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 as the situation evolves. Hmm. Uh, Nadia Ryan, anything to add to that, or should we move along? Okay. Next up, we have a question from Peter Urban. Uh, who is remarking on how NATO, after giving Russia assurances that it would not push east of Germany's eastern border, has swallowed up virtually everything west uh, of Ukraine and Belarus while rejecting Russia's own application to join the NATO alliance. How can you dismiss Russian concerns about a powerful military alliance hostile to Russia, potentially gaining access to bases on the very borders of Russia? I mean, that's the, the, the Mersheimer argument. John Mersheimer has been out kind of banging this drum very loudly in a lot of different places right now that the United States created the conditions for this crisis by um, allowing the possibility to even be raised for Ukraine to become part of NATO or part of the European European community. Um, I wouldn't say it's a, I, I wouldn't characterize myself as, dis, I would, don't think any of us are, are dismissive of the, of the argument. Um, I don't think that, uh, and, and I would would say that that for me personally, looking at this moment as a as a historian, I I do as I, as I said, uh, see us in an inflection point insofar as the United States' supremacy of a region that has historically been very very significant in international politics is on the decline, and I think that the tragedy of of this moment is both that Ukraine has been a functioning, a functioning democracy, a, um, probably the most democratic of the of the former Soviet states, uh, and there is some some truth to the to the fact that this is a territory that has also been historically under the the, the dominion of, of of Russia. And I'm not sure that the United States has, irrespective of what we think, sitting here in Albany, um, I'm not sure the United States has the capacity. Uh, to really to really change any anything or any of these 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 trends and so i'm uh not dismissive but i do think it's a genuine tragedy um and i and i think it's calling it such as it's not necessarily uh the same thing as um as distorting uh the the the, the politics around around nato nato expansion nadia how do you how do you read this i mean you're probably much more embedded in in this conversation than i am um it's it's very problematic because indeed, Peter Urban, you're right. This is absolutely what um, what not only Russia trots out, but what any number of Americans trot out as well. Um, I think it's partly a matter of what just what guarantees were actually given as opposed to what guarantees people thought were given. I think it is true that in the early 90s in particular, well, not, actually not the early 90s, in the late 90s in particular, um, Putin in, in particular felt spurned about the, um, about the offers that he gave um, and that 
at a point when he was most inclined to be friendly, he was rejected. But all of that said, um, all of that said, the, the really striking thing to me is that before 2014, even after the Orange Revolution, there was almost no sentiment in Ukraine for actually joining NATO. You, you didn't see it, you didn't hear it. I think that what sentiment exists in Ukraine now, and now it's real sentiment, is that now it's clear that, um, that there actually is a real chance that they would be attacked in a way that they didn't believe it before. So. Okay. So I would, uh, let me jump in here and just say, uh, one, give a couple of book recommendations, not from anybody, not from any on our panel, but uh, Mary Surratt has uh, some really great, she's a historian who has worked on this time period in NATO expansion and the end of the Cold War. So she has a book, I think it's called 1989. Uh, uh, Ryan can correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, that's about the end of the Cold War. And then she has a, a follow-up, a successor book that looks at uh, uh, NATO expansion and sort of US-Russian relations in the 1990s. And um, I've heard her speak about uh, this and, and, and read some of the work. And what comes back to me, and I think it's inherent in the question, and it's what I think people like Ryan and I, especially as historians of the United States, find interesting. Um, and I don't know if Nadia periodizes the same way that we do. Um, or she may, but for different reasons. But it really does point to that period in the 1990s as, again, uh, a, a, an inflection point, to use Ryan's term, where the rules of international politics and the supposed sort of regimes that are going to govern it are being recreated in ways that we're still sorting out today. Um, and so, uh, you know, typically when oftentimes in the past when I used to lecture much closer to this period when it was like 2000 and I was lecturing on this period, I would sort of get to the end of the Cold War and we'd be done. Uh, 1989, we're, we're finished. Um, and now, uh, from the perspective of, of 2022, I look back on the 1990s as this really vital moment in explaining um, the shape of the world to come. Right, uh, both from American expectations, but also, I mean, one of the things that I've learned in, 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 from uh, that author I mentioned, uh, Surat, is the is really how important it was for other countries like Russia. Uh, and I was glad to hear Nadia talk a little bit about how how uh, that moment may have shaped uh, uh, Russian expectations and what 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 Mr. Putin is thinking right now. Um, but it really does point to that that moment as as just vital in understanding where where we are today. Not one inch is the name of Mary's book, the the most recent one, and it is exactly on this 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 issue of NATO NATO expansion and the perceptions on all sides about what was guaranteed and what wasn't guaranteed and what would the implications of that be in the uh, you know in the, in the immediate aftermath of the Soviet Union's uh, collapse. Mm. Well, thanks for that, guys. So we will move on now to a question uh, from Robert's iPad. Uh, uh, why do you think the current situation is not a battle for the soul of mankind, uh, not a democratic versus autocracy battle? Carl, you can. You can <laughs> I guess I'm you. the one who opened that can of worms. So I'll, yeah. uh, I'll, <laughs> I'll start to handle it and then tag in uh, some of my colleagues here. Um, why is it not a battle for the soul of mankind? Well, because I do think that, uh, I, I think that the answer to that involves actually sort of deconstructing um, that phrase that George H.W. Bush used um, back in the, in the late 1980s. And I think what he was getting at was that the conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union uh, was not only a conflict between those two countries, but between uh, the supposed East and the West, right? So you're looking at a, a global competition that seemed to break down along, along uh, not just political or military or diplomatic lines, but along cultural and social lines as well. And it did involve that conflict uh, by the 1980s, um, involved all parts of the globe. Um, and so it, it, the reason why that phrase is uh, evocative of the Cold War is because it, it hints at the totality of that conflict, at least as, as a certain set of American elites thought about it, 
Okay. Um, and they played, those American elites played a really important role in shaping the United States' stance towards the Soviet Union and thinking through uh, all of the permutations of that, of that so-called battle for the soul of mankind. Um, my sense is that we are not in that moment right now. The, the ideological uh, 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 underpinnings of the current crisis are not as deep and are not as, um, as uh, frankly, vital, right? Um, in, in some ways, right, uh, if you listen to people who, who were actors during the Cold War, they spoke about the Cold War as a battle between two systems uh, and two ways of organizing societies. I don't hear a lot of that talk right now, although it may, it may evolve into that. And, and I will take this point, and I think Nadia wants to, is going is gonna to maybe correct me a little bit on this. In the sense that that's a very American, U.S. sort of centered view, and I imagine it might look very different from uh, from Eastern Europe. And so I'd be curious to hear how Nadia thinks through that analogy or that that description, and then how she sees it playing out in in current politics. So that's a sort of an American foreign policy uh, political answer, uh, history wise. But I, I'm curious to hear what my colleagues say. Thanks, Carl. Well, you you set me up as a mayor of Washington. <laughs> set in a very different context. Um, I think I think the other the, the other big difference that I would add is that, um, and maybe I'm saying this because I read the Financial Times and um, the Economist. But the really striking thing is how much more the Russian economy seems to be integrated into the economy of Europe, as well as the United States. And energy is the obvious example. Um, um, but one might also add things like aluminum and various precious metals necessary to make, I don't know, catalytic converters, various chips, et cetera. And it, frankly, the, the interesting thing to me is the degree to which people are willing to be completely candid and open about, you know, like Woody Allen and Annie Hall. I need the, you know, you know, I, I need the eggs. We need the eggs. I mean, so that in other words, we would like to take, you know, a, a moral high ground stand if we, if we're meaning the United States. But you know, but basically, we, we want to have our cake and eat it too, not to mix metaphors. And so, um, like the the thing, frankly, that I find reassuring in an odd way is how pragmatic everyone is being. I understand that it's frustrating um, to people who would like to see um, more grandiloquence, more grandstanding, but I actually think that this has the virtue of making reactions um, manageable and something and not, not promising things that the United States isn't actually, or Europe for that matter, isn't actually going to deliver. Frankly, I find, um, and this is actually confirms exactly what Carl said, I find the reactions of Europe much more interesting than those of the United States, in fact, because this seems to have had a much more galvanizing effect on Europe qua Europe than it has on the United States. And I, I'm not, competent to talk about China, but that would be something to bring into the mix as well, perhaps to the real geopolitical experts out there. The only thing I'd add just to extend, in some respects, it's just kind of connecting what Nadia and Carl have already said is that the the Cold War is a, as an intellectual project or as a battle for the soul of mankind. It existed in a particular context, right? This is a world of really dominated by European empires, by the British Empire, by the French Empire. And I think both the Soviet Union and the United States saw themselves as anti-imperial political projects, as alternatives. Now, we can say that's, that's problematic, that that wasn't necessarily true. But the degree to which liberal capitalists in the United States and, and communists in the Soviet Union really saw themselves leading, spearheading a project that was anti-imperial, I think can't be under, under, underestimated that the, the fight was over freedom, right? You've defined freedom as a series of rights in a liberal society, and that's the basis of free world project, or do you define freedom as the redistribution of, of, of equality? Uh, through through um, various uh, state led state led projects, and I think that's gone. You know, this is not. The, I, I don't think uh, any of the players. Maybe Europe is the, the the exception. Has a real ideological argument, and in fact, I think most intellectuals on the right and the left, the United States at least, 
you know, see the United States principally as an empire uh, today, not as a not as a uh, you know a liberal internationalist power building in, you know a, a international community in the way that we used to talk in the 1990s about about all of, all of this. And I think that that context um, uh, really changes or makes the changes the context around the around the the Cold War analogy or, or makes it renders it. Uh, moot in my in, in my opinion i think that the the geopolitics everybody is nice that is is thinking pragmatically they're also thinking in terms of real polit politic nadia you're you're more tied into europe than i think than i know i am uh and so i'm wondering are the is your interpretation of it that the europeans see this as a moment of of being forced to rethink security arrangements but not these other things that you know maybe it, I, the implication was not economics right and maybe not social arrangements and this is where migration comes in maybe it is a rethinking of migration uh being forced to rethink it but do you see what i'm getting at like how are they what's your sense of how they conceptualize this in the larger like why it ma matters in the larger sense um part of it is security and part of it is energy because let's not, and they're not necessarily the same thing, let's not forget that Europe is much more green than the United States, and Europe is much more committed to being green than the United States. So in fact, to me, the really interesting thing about what this has done is that this has framed also the issues of Europe's energy future, right? I mean, that Nord Stream 2 the idea that the pipeline um, that Russia could send gas directly to Germany, bypassing Ukraine. Um, and like the, the interesting thing now is that in effect, um, Europe has fast forwarded from an energy point of view, like just at the point where they thought that they had left coal behind and they could leave it behind forever. You know, ha, 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 ha. You know there's actually coal like now has a new lease on life in the transition moment as they um, scramble for, for what to do next. And there is also a sense um, absolutely that it's time to start using the word post, that it's time to stop using the word post-Soviet because post Soviet, like that, that era is also gone. Like this is the start of something new. And it's actually extremely interesting to read European newspapers, whether German or French or British, and to see um, how much everyone is very quickly saying, okay, now we are in, this actually is a new European order. And, 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 and we ourselves, i.e. we Europeans are trying to figure out what it means. Well, excellent. Again, a lot to think about there, guys. Uh, thank you so much for all of your insights. But at this point, it is 7.04, and we're going to want to slightly transition away from questions or comments from our academics uh, and to comments, uh, opinions, beliefs, uh, statements of feeling from the audience itself. And I'm going to uh, post in the chat here. We, we're going to have some rules of this discussion. I am going to be the moderator, but I, I trust that uh, things will stay quite moderate, um, but we, we do have some rules nonetheless, uh, and I'm putting them in the chat right here. You should be able to see those are our general guiding principles for how this discussion is going to work. Uh, first and foremost, be respectful, be humble. Uh, secondly, after being called on, everyone is limited to two minutes of speaking time, and we do this not to shut people up, but again, just to give people, everyone who wants to participate, uh, a chance to speak. We have 63 people in the, this chat, so if everyone wants to speak, we, we have to keep things moving along. Thirdly, we will give everyone a chance to speak once before anyone is giving a chance to speak multiple times. Again, this is not necessarily designed for back and forth debate. This is first and foremost to, to hear the opinions of as many people uh, as possible. Uh, very important, next up is no personal attacks. Uh, participants may respond to the arguments of others, but may not make judgments uh, as to the character or the intelligence of their peers. Uh, if you think that someone is being dumb, well, don't don't say that, just say that their argument is flawed. Please uh, do, uh, we're, we're gonna stick to that, that's, that's important. Um, and then lastly, violations of the rules will in result possibly in a verbal warning, uh, possibly muting, or heck, we could even kick you out of the lobby altogether. But I know, I know that we're not going to have to do any of that because we are all uh, re respectful people here in the chat. Um, so the way this is going to work, uh, if you would like to say something to speak out one way or the other about this, this discussion, uh, you are invited now to raise your hand, to virtually raise your hand. I mean, you can do it in real life too if you want to, uh, but that, one's, that won't do you any good. Uh, and if you don't know how to do that, if you go down to the participants uh, tab 
on the bottom of your screen. Uh, and you click on that, that should give you the option to raise your hand there. Uh, so that should be pretty self-explanatory. We already have at least one person raising his hand, a familiar face. Uh, Mark, I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to unmute you now, or you're actually, you're already unmuted. All right, why don't you say your piece, Mark? Muted only uh, internally, but um, so this is, <clears throat> I don't, and my thought is that um, <clears throat> after the whole Black Lives Matter movement, and as we all know, um, that the, the existence of cell phones and the ability of people to take videos of horrific acts real time and post them immediately, um, made a huge difference in our society. Um, and I'm just wondering if people think that um, the fact that we're in this era um, will lead to some restraint on the part of the Russians. Mm. Um, well, we perhaps might certainly hope so. Oh, one thing I also should have mentioned, folks, we are recording this. I don't know if you guys knew that. We are recording this. Um, it's uh, going to be uploaded to our Facebook page later. So again, just another part of the rules of the discussion. Don't don't say anything that you, you wouldn't you know, want to be heard. Not that, of course, Mark's, your statement's very, very reasonable, but uh, I just thought I'd mention that now, get everyone's uh, informed uh, opinion about that. Anything else you'd like to say, Mark? You've got uh, about another minute, if you'd like. Okay, well, thank you for that, Mark. Anyone else like to raise your hand? We currently have no one, uh, no one queued up to, to speak here. Anyone? Can I, I mean, like, my family is waiting to have dinner with me, but can I respond to Mark really quickly before I go? Absolutely. Um, if I may? Okay, thank you. Um, Mark, um, I think uh, on the one hand, yes, there is, um, but I think it, frankly, I think it much more likely that um, the Russians really thought it was going to be over much more quickly than it did. And they, in fact, did not want to blow Ukraine out of existence. They wanted to take it over. There's a very big difference. And so um, it actually would also like